Kunaligwe, Nega, Bina, Cthulhu, Ra, Nega, Negle, Thu, Ata, to Cthulhu. So overall, yeah, pretty normal Saturday. Hello YouTube, today we'll be looking at our first HP Lovecraft movie. Now, if you don't know who he is, allow me to explain. He was a writer in the 1920s to the 1930s, where he unfortunately died, pretty young in fact. He has over a hundred stories to his name, and well, even though they didn't get that big of a following when they first came out, they have since gone a pretty big following actually and are most well known for the Cthulhu mythos, which you might have heard about on occasion. Now, as for film adaptations, there haven't really been all that many, or at least compared to the likes of Stephen King or Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft really kind of gets the shaft in adaptations. Maybe it's because his stories mostly revolve around what you don't see instead of what you do, or maybe it's just because horror movies nowadays don't really get that much of a budget and for to adapt the Cthulhu mythos or something like that, you would need a pretty pricey budget there, so maybe that's why. Really, I can't say for certain, but those are pretty good reasons. However, there have been some notable film adaptations, such as the Stuart Gordon movies, and also the John Carpenter Apocalypse Trilogy, which you might have heard about since it started with The Thing, one of the most popular horror movies ever made. The Apocalypse Trilogy was very heavily influenced by H.P. Lovecraft, especially with the last movie of The Bunch. However, we will not be looking at any of those today. We will instead be looking at The Unnameable, a 1980 adaptation of Howard's very short story, which is only like 19 minutes on an audiobook, so yeah, they stretched this movie out to an hour and a half and also gave it a sequel. Naturally. So yeah, let's take a look at it. The movie starts off actually very similar to the story that it's based on, with Carter and Joel talking about the legends of the Unnameable, which eventually turns into arguing because Joel thinks that something without a name can never exist ever. You know, Homo sapiens probably took a long time to think up. There are new species being discovered all the time, and there's a lot of experimentation involved and thought into putting in a new name for a completely new species, and seeing as only two people have seen this thing, one of which you died, the other of which you went mad. I don't see why this thing would have a name, Joel. Really, he's a science major. He should know this. But, yeah, no matter what, he just argues it can never have a name because it's so therefore it's not real. If it doesn't have a name, not real whatsoever, completely undeniably true. So, yeah, he's kind of an idiot. But the only real addition to the story here is that a few of the events are changed up and there's the addition of the character Howard, who was put in because he's going to be important to the movie later. So yeah, I can very much understand why they made these changes. The movie only really starts to stray from the book after a bat attacks Joel and Carter and Howard. Yeah, in the book it did the same thing, but after that they immediately got attacked and hospitalized by the unnameable, and yeah, it's kind of easy to assume that Joel might have gone mad from that, and Carter was just really interested in it. And outside of that, though, they were fine. So yeah, the movie does stray from that with... Instead, Joel going inside the house, and Carter and Howard just going back to Miskatonic University. And for those of you who don't know, Miskatonic University takes place in Arkham. Both these locations have been used in so many Lovecraft stories. I can't say that I hate it for that or anything. In fact, I actually really do like that. It makes it much it makes all the stories feel much more connected, and I actually do really think that's a cool way of doing it. 
But yeah, I just find it really fun to just point out how many different times they've been in freaking Arkham. Seriously, I've only read like two stories where it might not have taken place there. One of which where it was in New York, and another one where they're in an institution. However, there's an institution in Arkham, so I really can't say for certain if that one actually took place there or not. So, yeah. Pretty awesome. So, when they get back, Howard continues to worry about Joel, who's doing just fine outside of the fact that he had his head ripped right off. So, yeah, outside of that, though, he's doing great. And, yeah, Howard's worried because it's been a few hours, and even though he said he was going to come back tomorrow, he hasn't come back yet. Completely justified reason for being worried there, obviously. So... Yeah, Howard keeps on asking Carter, hey, maybe we should go back. Should we go back? Do you think that we should go back? And Carter just says, no, he'll be fine. Don't worry about it. He's just pranking us. So, yeah, Joel died. Bummer for Joel. I actually kind of like this character. But then later on in the library, we see Howard still worried about Joel because it's been a day now. So, yeah, he's a bit more justified. And his parents have actually called the school saying that he hasn't come home. So yeah, it's a bit more justified now, although Carter still thinks that he's just pulling a prank on them. And Howard's still very worried about it, however, he's pretty alright with everything after his crush Wendy walks by. She is so boring, I cannot even say how much. But Wendy also has a friend, Tanya, and they start talking for a while about how they're in college and the only way to get ahead in the world is by using what they got because obviously they were able to get into this very good college so obviously they can't just make it with I don't know actually being smart or something no instead what they gotta use is their sexuality obviously even Tanya brings up how that's pretty stupid but Wendy just says shut up so yep I guess that makes sense so and then they're approached by John and Bruce, two guys who are at the college who are pretty much just jerks, except for maybe Bruce. And pretty much they invite them to the exact same house where the unnameable is because coincidences. So they decide to go there that night and of course John and Bruce's real motivations are revealed. They want to get laid. Very, very shocking for a 1980s B-horror movie. It's really not. So, yeah, they get there, and apparently they think that fear is the only thing that makes women horny. Yeah, sure, keep on believing that, guys. So, yeah, I really don't get that. They're just going into a creepy house. They could have the same effect from watching a horror movie marathon or something. I really don't get why they need to put all this time and effort into finding this creepy house and also finding out where it is, making sure that no one lives on it, making sure that they're allowed to walk into it, and also then going there and finding it in the middle of the woods. So yeah, that's a whole lot of work in order to just simply get laid. They probably could have just gone to a brothel or something, or maybe they just didn't want to use all the money for student loans or something, I really don't know. But, hey, who knows, maybe I'm completely wrong, and the reason why they actually found this house is because they enjoyed brisk walks in the woods, and just sort of came upon this house and said to each other, You know what? This is a perfect place to get women scared enough to get laid. Obviously, this is a great idea. We should totally break into this place and do that. So, yeah, I really don't know what they were thinking there. But, yeah, anyway, I think that Miskatonic has proven that, yeah, it doesn't really always have the best people who actually study there. I mean, in this movie, there are people that find out about an unnameable creature and just decide to have a little freeze frame happy reunion at the end and aren't completely scarred for life from this. There are people who bring the dead back to life there. There are people who create things that can create machines that can alter your mind in order for you to see eels floating around in pink lights. So yeah, maybe Miskatonic is just a really, really weird school. Maybe Wendy is right. She maybe might actually have to use what she has to get ahead. It's 
I mean, she's got a lot of competition. People bringing the dead back to life, that's kind of hard to beat. So yeah, maybe, maybe she has a point there. But anyway, they get to the house and then Wendy and Tanya get there and yeah, even though earlier they said, eh, we don't scare easily, upon seeing the house, they're immediately terrified by it and saying, yeah, maybe we shouldn't go in there. It looks kind of scary. What were they expecting? Oh, we're gonna go to the scary house. Oh, okay, we'll come. We don't scare easy. Then when they get there, oh my god, this place looks scary. Isn't that shocking? Really, what? So, yeah, they're also kind of idiots, but, yeah, anyway, they get there, and they eventually go inside with the door locking behind them, because whoever put a curse on this house so that then the unnameable can't leave the place whatsoever, they also decided it'd be kind of funny to make sure that the door can't be opened from the inside, so then if, you know, the unnameable's coming after you and trying to kill you or something, then you have no excuse. Escape. What nice people. So, yeah, really, really dumb design there. But anyway, then we get the next half hour of these idiots walking around a house. Yay. So glad we had them walking around a house and being scared by everything that moves in it. So yeah, that's really what happens for like the next half hour. Eventually they do s separate and John and Wendy go have sex, joy, and Bruce is really drunk and tries to rape Tanya. Oh joy. Eventually she's able to just make him stop and then they actually sit down and have a very nice discussion about Bruce feeling bad about his girlfriend who moved away and having to deal with that and actually it's kind of nice. It gives him some good development. He doesn't even try and do anything to Tanya here, which makes me think that, yeah, this is actually genuine and him not just giving her a sob story so then he can get laid. I really do actually think that, yeah, this might actually be what he's going through here and he just didn't want to talk about it to his friend because he might seem like a loser if he did that. So yeah, I actually did kind of like this development for him and now out John and Bruce, I definitely think that Bruce is the more interesting one here. Then they actually just sort of sit around and talk about that. I actually found that pretty nice. Especially since B-horror movies of the 80s didn't really do that that often. So I really do like that they did that here. And then we cut back to John and Wendy screwing. Yay! I'm so glad that we can see more of that. Although eventually they're um, very, very important sex gets interrupted when a little thing of Joel's head comes rolling in, and yeah, Wendy's pretty scared about that, so yeah, not really the best day for them here, and then John dies, yay, I mean, sad, so sad, I miss him so much, that guy was a complete jerk and I hate him, I'm so upset that he died, so yeah, he died, how tragic. And then Bruce dies. That was actually a little bit sad because, hey, we actually got to know a little bit more about him before he died. So then that begs the question, why don't we spend time learning more about him instead of Tanya or, some, or someone else who might live a little bit longer? But yeah, anyway, Tanya and Wendy get separated and Wendy kind of gone nuts after seeing the unnameable. And also people die in front of her and a severed head just roll over towards her. So yeah, she's not having the best day. And Tanya's trying to keep things together so then they can get out. Eventually, Tanya does meet up with Howard and Carter, who have finally decided to come to the house because, well, Howard met with Carter eventually and said, Hey, yeah, you know, Joel's still at the house. Do you think that we should go and check on him or something? And then Kurt's like, yeah, okay, fine, if you're going to keep on asking about it. So they finally decide to go to the house. And when they get there, they're meeted by Tanya, who really, really isn't having the best day. And then we, they, her and Howard just sort of walk around the house for a bit, mostly because her and Howard had a bit of a relationship started up before. Like, they kind of subtly do this, not very well, but yeah, they show that Tanya did have a lot of interest in Howard and thought that he was cute, so 
Yeah, now they're walking around this terrifying house with a killer monster in it. Uh, at least she's gonna die with the guy that she has a mild crush on. Good for her. And Carter just sort of sticks behind so he can keep on reading the Necronomicon some more. And yeah, the Necronomicon in this movie looks really, really bland. You see this version that I have back here? This is actually based off of the 1993 film adaptation of Necronomicon, The Book of the Dead. This was the design of it in the movie. Now, compared to other versions, it is kind of simplistic with it just being some gold popping up on top of a black cover, although in the movie it was more green. But, yeah, I actually do like the look of this one. And, heck... Even if you don't like this version, you still have the Evil Dead version, which is a human face. I mean, yeah, okay, this one doesn't really look that much like humans, like it's wrapped in human skin and inks and blood, but hey, it's still pretty cool. In this movie, it's just a normal book, except it has Cthulhu spells and stuff in it. So, yeah, it's kind of neat, too, not really. So, yeah. How Carter just keeps on reading from it in order to just to try and find a spell that might be able to defeat the creature that he hasn't seen yet, so he doesn't know if it's real. All that he has to go off of here is that one person said, hey, I think there might be a killer creature in here, so obviously that must be the unknowable, and she's not just being hysterical or anything. So, yeah, pretty good reason to just decide to try and decode a whole entire completely dead language book which he can apparently read because he's just a folklore major obviously folklore majors need to know the Cthulhu language obviously so yeah Howard and Tanya keep on walking through the house but eventually they get separated and Howard meets up with Wendy who's yeah pretty nuts right now and actually tries to kill Howard but She's stopped by the unnameable, and Howard meets back up with Tanya, and they meet up with the unnameable, and Carter decides the only way to defeat the unnameable is by going outside, going into a crypt with rats in it, so that's kind of scary to him for a second, and then just saying a spell, because he clearly could have only done that inside of a crypt, and that spell makes some demon trees come after the unnameable and defeat it. But before that happened, we see that the unnameable was actually kind of easy to beat here. Tanya just hits it with a flashlight and then its hand is pretty much broken. Then Howard just sort of very easily peels off a little bit of its skin. I mean, yeah, okay, this thing is very old, so you could say that, yeah, its skin really isn't in the best shape right now, but really, that was so easy. But, yeah, it is still a demon, so I guess I can understand why you need demon trees to fight it off. And, yeah, the trees defeat it, and Howard and Tanya walk off to, I don't know, be terrified by more evil Lovecraftian demons. However, Carter was also dragged underground by skeletons, who also had purple lights around them. Yeah, I don't know. But he was dragged underground by that, so they got drag him out. And what did we learn about why there were skeletons down there dragging him down? And what he saw down in this completely unknown area that could be this whole entire little cracky area with tons of demons in it or something? Oh, we learned absolutely nothing. Yay. Although Carter does say that he's gonna tell Howard and Tanya what he saw, because obviously after defeating a demon, they really do want to hear more about the demon stuff. Carter's such a nice guy. And then they walk off and it has a very cheesy freeze frame as they all walk off together. Really, that was just very silly. Just they walk off and they're just like, oh, Howard, I got so much to tell you about this freeze frame. It's weird. It's kind of a weird ending. And then the credits just roll over them just standing there. So, yeah. That was it. I gotta say, though, this movie was actually pretty good. I really didn't expect that much from this movie when I first watched it, but I gotta say, it's one of the better adaptations of Lovecraft stories. 
mostly because it's a cheesy 80s B-horror movie. And you know what? I love those. This one really does do it well. Honestly, I found this movie to be pretty engaging. Some of the characters are actually pretty interesting. And, well, yeah, there is that very slow part with John, Wendy, Bruce, and Tanya just walking through the house. Just saying stupid stuff where they think that it's going to be scary. And they continue to walk and walk and walk and walk and then have sex. And then almost get raped and then actually have a very nice discussion. And then continue to walk and have sex. And God, it is so boring for that time. It goes on for like a half an hour, and that's really the slowest part of the movie. However, it does do a good job at building up tension to the unnameable creature, which I gotta say was actually built up to very well. It's never actually shown until the end, and I actually do very much like its reveal. The only thing I had to complain about with that is that it's shown fully in the trailer, except it's just shown pretty quick. And the poster, the only versions of it that I can find, all have the unnameable creature just slapped right onto it. So yeah, you already know what the creature looks like, so it's kind of pointless in building up to it. However, I will say, I do actually like the reveal of it, and while, yeah, the effects are kind of cheesy for it, I do still actually really like the look of it. It's pretty much just like a white demon that's aged a whole lot with wings on it and very very sharp fangs. I actually really do like the design of the creature itself. So yeah I do like the execution of that. Also it does actually do a pretty good job at making some of these characters pretty interesting. Like Howard, he starts off in this movie as being kind of a loser but then eventually at the end he becomes someone who's beat a demon. He's actually really awesome, and I do like the evolution of the, most of the characters in this movie. And, well, yeah, if you're not into B-horror movies or the cheesiness that they've provided over the years, then, yeah, chances are you probably won't like this. However, if you are into those, this is definitely a movie to check out. It's a lot of fun. I've been, I've watched it, like, three times now, and, yeah, I actually plan on watching it a whole lot more. It's a super enjoyable movie. And one that I really do recommend. So, for the story, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 as, yeah, it's not the best. As, yeah, it is pretty simple with, it's a haunted house, it's a monster in it, you just got to go in there and then you'll be trapped there and might die. So, you just got to beat the creature in order to get out. It's a pretty simple story, but an execution is actually very fun and one that I really did have a fun time watching. So yeah, 7 out of 10. Now let's get into the characters. So when it comes down to the characters, they're a rather mixed bag to me. I'm going to do something a little bit different than what I normally do though. I'm going to talk about my least favorite first because I want to get them out of the way fast. First off we got John. Oh god, is this guy an a-hole? Really, all he ever talks about is sex, 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 sex. Isn't that exciting? And yeah, that's pretty much his whole personality. He just wants to get laid and that's his purpose for living apparently. And, yeah, he's just kind of a jerk about it. And when all he really wants to do is have sex in his life, yeah, I really didn't feel that bad when he got killed. So, yeah, I really didn't like John. He was just very annoying to me. So, yeah, I really hated John. Then after him, we have Bruce. Now, I will say he was much better than John, mostly because of what I brought before with that one little moment where him and Tanya were just sitting down and talking. That was actually a very nice moment and actually got me to care about him a whole lot more than I did John because he actually seemed to have actually cared about Tanya a little bit more or actually just people in general and then seem to only be fixated on sex. So that was a very nice addition that he was actually a person instead of just someone who just wanted to have sex all the time. I actually very much like how they did that, and hey, it's an 80s B-horror movie. That was actually pretty uncommon at the time. So when Bruce did die, I was actually feeling sorry for him. Then we got Wendy. Freaking Wendy. Okay, so 
Yeah, you know how I said John was super annoying? So was Wendy. So yeah, I guess it's kind of nice that they found each other because they are perfect for one another. They both talk about sex all the time and Wendy is even more annoying somehow. Really, she somehow found a way to be more annoying than a guy who just simply talks about sex all the time. Yeah, I don't even think that that was possible until I saw her. But really, she found a way. Mostly because she says earlier that she doesn't get scared easily, but then when she goes in the haunted house, okay, well, the unnameable house, whatever, it's a haunted house, pretty much. But yeah, she goes into the house, and then she is terrified of every little thing. Seriously, I can at least understand why Tanya was like this, because she didn't want to go into the, into the place in the first place. It was just Wendy who convinced her to. So yeah, she actually didn't want to go in there anyway, so her being scared makes sense. Wendy seemed like she was perfectly fine with going in, mostly because she probably just wanted to have sex. So yeah, she at least had a reason for going in there that would probably overpower her fear, and eventually it does, but throughout most of the movie with her, and yeah, it is like a half an hour that we spend watching her moan and gripe about every little thing that could be scary to her. A guy walking out with a candle was scary to her. Ooh. Yeah, she was really annoying. Then after that, she just goes nuts because she saw the unnameable and yeah, a guy get killed in front of her. Makes sense why she would go nuts after that, but she's still super annoying there. So yeah, when she finally does get killed by the unnameable, I was super happy about it. And also, she was a complete a-hole to Howard, who was actually a very nice guy who actually just wanted to get to know her a little bit more. But no, since, I don't know, she was he was a freshman or something, the, that's her reason for not liking him. Yeah, I really don't get her. Then after her, we got Tanya. She is so much better than Wendy. Much like Bruce is to John, Tanya is actually very likable compared to their friend. I mean, really, Tanya, I can understand her here. She's con she's a very shy person who just sort of follows Wendy into what they do. And yeah, that makes sense for her character. It makes sense why she would go into this house in the first place, even though she's afraid of it. She was just following her friend's example. And... And she actually sits down and talks with a guy who almost raped her in order to just figure out what's going on with him. And she actually treats it very well. I can definitely say that she's a better person than I would be there. So yeah, I actually do think that she was a very good character. And after that, when the unnameable starts going around killing people, she actually does do something proactive. Unlike Wendy, who just goes nuts and tries to kill Howard. I guess so then she could get a higher kill count than the unnameable, and that would make it so embarrassed that it would just go off and die. I really don't know what her plan was. So yeah, really, Tanya here is so much more interesting than Wendy, and I actually very much enjoyed her. It's actually very unfortunate that she was left out of the sequel. I would have liked seeing her more. And yeah, they do cut her out of the sequel. I think that they said something about her being in a state of shock, but that really makes no sense because at the very end of the movie, she walks off happy like Carter and Howard, so I don't see why she would just randomly be like, oh man, that was scary! <laughs> like, really, why would that happen? So then after her, we have Joel. I enjoyed him. Now, the biggest problem with Joel, even though he is a likable character for the most part, and yeah, compared to some other characters, John and Wendy in this movie, I actually did very much enjoy him. However, he's not in the movie very long, only given like two scenes and just a lot of lip service, and he just sort of feels like he's just there in order to get things to happen, like his head being rolled over to Wendy in order to start off the killing spree in the house, and him being the reason why Howard and Carter go back to the house. Outside of that, though, he was a nice character enough, and I did like him enough to not want to see him die. But, yeah, he's not enough to make him a very interesting character, at least not compared to all the others in this. Then we got the unnameable. 
very mixed on her. Mostly because, well, yeah, I really do like her design. It's very creative, and I do actually like the appearance of it. I especially like how they keep her hidden throughout so much of the movie, so there's a lot of tension to actually find out what she looks like. Again, unless if you saw the trailer or the poster where they do actually show her. But yeah, I do still like the build up to her reveal, and the reveal is actually very nice. However, she's not that developed outside just being the monster in this movie. Now, yeah, they do reference what happens in the sequel where it's revealed that that guy that she killed in the opening, yeah, that was her dad, and he apparently put a spell on her in order to save her life, and yeah, that pretty much joined her with a demon. Her dad was kind of an idiot, but yeah, I do still at least like her for the most part as, yeah, she is just a crazy monster, and that's pretty fun. And yeah, I do actually like her design and everything. I don't really hate her or anything. The most annoying thing about her is that she always yells in this high pitch, ah, annoying voice. It got so annoying after a while. I just yelled, shut up. Someone's trying to sleep in this house. So yeah, I was very, very annoying with that yelling. But outside of that, she was alright. And while yeah, she does get much more development in the sequel, and the first one, she's all, she's good enough as is. Really, her just being the killer demon in this one is very much enough here. And yeah, I do enjoy her for the most part. It's just I prefer her in the sequel more because there she gets a whole lot more development. Then we got Howard. He's actually a very, very good character. I honestly don't mind his addition to the story here unlike some others, John and Wendy. So, yeah, I actually do very much like how they did Howard here. He's a pretty interesting character and actually a pretty nice guy. We do get to see the development of him being someone who kind of just goes with the flow of everything to someone who actually takes action against the unnameable creature. I do actually very like how that was executed, and well, yeah, I have seen other stories with that done better, Howard here isn't actually that bad, and I really did want to see him make it out alive, which I was very happy that he did. So yeah, I very much enjoyed Howard, and I'm glad that he came back in the sequel. I liked seeing more of him. And then we got Carter. Oh boy, Carter is fun in this. He is so much fun. Out of all the actors in this movie, I'm really disappointed that, Car that Carter's actor didn't go anywhere else. Like, yeah, okay, that is something that happened with most of the cast of this movie. They didn't really go on to acting after this. However, I just really enjoyed Carter's performance in this. His actor did a great job expressing the eccentric personality of him while also showing that he does indeed care for his friends and does want to help them out in any way that he can. It's just that he's more of a folklore major, so he wants to use what he knows in order to do that. Now, I did like how it was executed. Now... Much like with the unnameable, he does get much more development in the sequel. And I do like how that was executed there as well. It's just that I really did very much enjoy him as a side character in this movie. And I think that he was done a bit better here than he was in the sequel. I'll get on to that when I get into the sequel. But there, there seemed to be a bit too much of a focus on him. And while, yes, I very much do enjoy his role in this movie, I do kind of wish that they had cracked down on his performance in the sequel, as there was just a bit too much of him that overshadowed the other characters. Here, he gets a nice, very good balance of it. And honestly, I just kind of wish I had seen more of him here. Honestly, I wish there were more unnameable movies I could check out. So then I could see more of this character, or any of these characters that I like. There are quite a few good ones that definitely are a very good reason to actually watch this movie. So, for the characters, I'm going to give them a 6 out of 10 because, well, yes, there are some that are pretty bad, like John and Wendy. There are also some others that don't really get as much attention as I would have preferred, like Joel or Bruce. But then there are all the others that... I do actually like for the most part, and yeah, they're actually very enjoyable and add on to why I like this movie as much as I do. So, for this movie overall, it's a lot of fun. Really, if you like B-horror movies or Lovecraft stories, I definitely recommend checking this one out. Maybe a little bit less so if you're a Lovecraft fan, as yeah, this one really does stray from the story after the opening scenes, but... 
yeah, I do still like where they went with the story, and yeah, for having to make a movie about such a short story, I do like how it was executed here. They did a very good job and made it very fun and enjoyable. The characters are pretty interesting and very likable for the most part, outside of a few. The effects, well, not very good, because, well, this was a pretty cheap movie. They do still work pretty well with what they had, and... Well, yeah, there are some downsides to it, like the boring half hour where all people do is walk around a house and say sex, 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 and then have sex, and then die. Yeah, that part's kind of boring, but if you can get through that, then I definitely do recommend this movie. It's really good. Probably the biggest downside that I have for it is the lighting, which, yeah, it's really, really bad sometimes. Yeah, in the sequel, they really did improve the lighting usage, but even at that, it wasn't really that great either. But yeah, that's probably the biggest problem. You can't really see this movie in that great quality, because the lighting really isn't that good. But if you can get past that and that boring half hour, I do think that this is a very enjoyable movie, and one that I definitely recommend you guys checking out. It might not be the most faithful Lovecraft adaptation, but it is definitely a very good one, and one that I had a lot of fun watching. So, for this movie overall, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. It's a lot of fun, so yeah, check it out if you're interested. And next week, we will be looking at the sequel to The Unnameable, The Unnameable 2, The Statement of Randolph Carter, or The Unnameable Returns, depending on what title you're going with. But yeah, anyway, see you next week. Bye.